they're really, really excited. I've been working with them and Christian will tell us a lot more about it later on. Um, today we are, as I said, celebrating two new um, releases, one of which we have here, which is the Blanc de Blanc MAG 16, and Christian will hopefully explain more about um, what MAG means, um, and the Brut Intent um, 16, um, which unfortunately got stuck. Um, I'm really thrilled to have Christian here today. He's done a tasting for us before. Um, his passion for Lenobe and it's just overwhelming and I just love listening to him. Um, he's been Thank with you. Lenobe now for six years and just been a great teacher. Um, so Christian, hopefully you'll tell us about your state and about the three champagnes that we're tasting tonight. Um, over to you. Well, thank you, Sarah, so much for having me, and thank you for all of you for uh, joining us. Um, just to get one thing out of the way, uh, because it comes up sometimes, I really am French. I really promise you that I am in Champagne, and I've worked in Champagne for 22 years, but my mother was American, so that's why I have this accent. But in case you're wondering, who, who did Sarah invite to come talk to us about Champagne? I promise I'm French, but... Uh, I uh, grew up speaking English uh, to my American mother. Uh, so Champagne Le Noble, we are 100% uh, family owned, 100% uh, independent. Um, and this is really important uh, for, for us. Um, there are very, very few houses left in Champagne that are family owned, but there are even fewer that are completely independent. Uh, Champagne Air Le Noble was founded in uh, 1920. Um, interestingly enough, uh, most of the original Champagne houses uh, that were founded in the 18th and 19th century, so names like Heidsick, Tattinger, Bollinger, Krug, Rodewer, Deutz, they were all Germans, mostly from Westphalia. Uh, Armand Raphael Graser, so A-R in A-R Le Noble, uh, was from uh, Alsace. Uh, like my last name is Holthausen, but I'm not German, but Alsatian. So, um, he arrived in uh, Champagne uh, in 1915, in the middle of the First World War. And here in Champagne, um, we still talk about the First World War. The First World War completely devastated um, all of Eastern France. He arrived in uh, Champagne in 1915, started making uh, wine here in 1920. But having a last name that had German connotations would have just been like absolutely not possible after the Germans had uh, decimated. The, the trench uh, warfare was, was just, you know, about half an hour, like from here. So having a German last name wasn't possible. So he said, you know what, uh, I'm just going to uh, create a name. I will keep uh, my initials, Armand Raphael, A-R, and Le Noble, because I want to make uh, wines uh, sort of in the honor of the nobility of the wines of Champagne. Um, so today we are 5,406 producers in Champagne. We are the only 100% family owned house that does not have the name of the family on the label. When Anne and Antoine uh, travel, they just say, are you the Lenobles? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's easier than explaining uh, the war. Um, basically, uh, we were founded in uh, 1920. 1920 was very, very uh, difficult. Uh, because it was just after the war. Um, the very first uh, classification of cru uh, was not established until 1927. Um, Phylloxera was still real. The harvests were very, very uh, small. Um, many people in 1927 were asked to be part of the Appalachian. They actually said no, because it was more profitable to raise sheep, to raise cattle, uh, on the land uh, that, than it was to uh, grow grapes. Um, interestingly, all these years later, there's lots of people trying to say, oh, but we were originally asked uh, to be part of the Champagne Appalachian, but my great grandfather was crazy. He wanted to like raise cows. And the reason why this is such a, a subject is because the Champagne Appalachian in terms of size is really at its maximum of, 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 of what you know it can be planted now. Um, Something very interesting to know, and, and I think it's always quite um, surprising to some people. Uh, in a year like 2019, which was a classic year, 2020 is obviously a bit uh, atypical for all of us. But in 2019, the Champagne Appalachian sold 300 million bottles. 300 million bottles represents 
3% of the total of all French wines sold in 2019, and 24% of the value. Most Champagne is, uh, is overpriced, uh, to be sure. The value of the land in Champagne, if you are standing uh, on, in the small village that's not part of the Appalachian, uh, but just like on the village road, it's about uh, $10,000 a hectare. If you are standing on just something that's a basic village level uh, cru, you're 1.5 million euros. If you're standing on a grand cru, you're well over um, 3 million euros uh, the hectare. So um, in Champagne, you know, money has always played a very, very sort of big uh, part uh, in it. Um, to go back to Lenoble, um, so Armand Raphael started uh, Lenoble in uh, 1920. It then passed to his son, uh, Joseph, in uh, 1947. Joseph was the very first uh, member of the family to export uh, wines. Um, and in 1966, the very first person in the world that exported our wines was Stephen Spurrier into the UK. Stephen Spurrier later went on to serve uh, Lenoble uh, at his wedding to Bella in uh, 1968. So we have been uh, in the UK uh, longer than we've been anywhere else uh, in, in the world. Um, Joseph Grazer, the second generation, was uh, really good at public relations. He was not necessarily the best at uh, maintaining, uh, he liked to spend money for sure. So when he passed away, none of his children wanted to take over the house. So his uh, nephew, who was the grandson of Armand Raphael Grazer, uh, his uh, mom, uh, took over the house of Lenoble in uh, 1973. He was born in Chuy, which is the very first Grand Cru on the Côte Blanc. So those 10 hectares uh, came into the house in uh, 1973. He was married to Paulette uh, Meillan from the Premier Cru village of Bissaï. And those six hectares of Pinot uh, Noir, Premier Cru Pinot Noir came into the house at that time as well. And then he acquired uh, two hectares of Meunier here in the village of Damery. Uh, Damery is where the house is located. We're exactly between Cumière and uh, Epernay, so really in the heart of the Champagne uh, village. And things were going really well. And then in the early 1990s, uh, some of you remember, we had the Gulf War uh, and Champagne was like, um, and uh, Jean-Marie Malassin, was thinking about selling the house. In the early 90s, that was the formation of uh, LVMH, Moore, Tennessee, Pernod Ricard, all of these very, very large groups that wanted uh, to build and build and build their champagne brands. So most of the small independent uh, producers were purchased. Um, Jean-Marie called his daughter Anne, who was only 27 years old at the time. Uh, she was working at L'Oréal in Paris, like fresh out of college. And she uh, came back and took over the estate in 1993. Her brother Antoine joined her uh, three years later. Um, so this year, uh, 2020, is our centenary. It's our 100th birthday. Uh, for 100 years, we've been completely uh, family owned, but more importantly, completely independent. We do not have one single shareholder, investor, insurance company, bank, nothing of any uh, kind uh, supporting us. So. Um, it gives us a lot of freedom to say what we want, to do what we want. Uh, we don't have any shareholders uh, at all, which is actually quite unique in uh, Champagne. Um, we've been working with uh, Stannery since uh, the very beginning of Stannery. Um, I think one of the reasons why is that uh, Stannery is, is obviously the, the UK's leader in the great wines of Burgundy. And our approach uh, at Lenoble is certainly one that's very uh, Burgundian. Uh, also small family, independent, uh, making wines from our own uh, vineyards, which obviously is, is very important uh, as well. So it's always been a really nice uh, fit. Um, for us, we don't think of ourselves as a brand. We think of ourselves as a winery. We think of ourselves as a house. We think of ourselves as, uh, as a family. Um, in terms of the vineyards themselves, uh, the vineyards, uh, we own 18 hectares of uh, vineyards, so 32 acres um, between uh, Chouy, Grand Cru, Bissaye Premier Cru, and Damery here in the Marne Valley. Everything has been certified haute valeur environnementale since 2012. 
So Haute Valeur Environnementale, what does that mean? It's a completely organic uh, viticulture in every sense of the term with one caveat. Uh, the caveat is that uh, we have a real problem with mildew here in Champagne. Uh, it rains more than anywhere else in France with the exception of Alsace. Uh, so mildew is a real uh, problem. You can be certified organic and treat mildew using copper sulfite, but the mildew is so intense here that we would literally have to be treating some years. We'd have to be out there 20 or 25 times. So um, we prefer, uh, it's a bit like my mother is one of these people that doesn't even take like, uh, uh, I believe, like a paracetamol. Um, but when she had cancer, like you go in, you take care of it and you pull out, you're not constantly introducing something negative. So um, last year we didn't have to treat uh, against mildew once. Uh, in 2019, uh, we had to treat twice. So if we have to treat against mildew, we will do so chemically, but that's the only thing. We haven't used herbicides or pesticides in over 20 years. Um, we're very, very, very committed to uh, biodiversity. And I think most importantly, one of the things, we're all very postmodern uh, at the house. I don't like these false dichotomies of yes or no, organic or not organic. There are many, many different ways to make uh, wine. And I think that we run the, the risk of simplifying really, really complex uh, processes. Sometimes we have people that come to visit us after they've just spent a week uh, in the Rhone. And uh, they're like, well, in the Rhone, they're doing it like this. And I'm like, okay, the soil is different. The climate is different. The grapes are different. It's not like there's just this one way of applying uh, viticulture. Um, and I think let's have a bigger conversation about this and a bigger conversation about the way that we uh, farm. Um, in terms of challenges to the Appalachian, um, the biggest problem that we have in Champagne is climate change. My father's generation, um, we had no problems with acidity, but we had lots of problems with maturity, lots of problems with uh, alcohol and lots of problems uh, with uh, getting enough sugar. That's why if you look at, back sh at Champagne uh, 20, 30 years ago, the dosage was always like so high. Um, our generation now, we have no problems with alcohol, no problems with uh, maturity and no problems with sugar. However, we do have a problem with acidity. We do have a problem with freshness. The seven, seven earliest harvests in the history of the Champagne Appalachian have been this century starting in 2003. The harvest started in Champagne this year on August 13th. At Lenoble, we started on August 23rd. Uh, 20 years ago, we started the harvest the first week of October. So um, it's a real issue. So how do you combat climate change? Because in Champagne, if we don't have acidity and freshness, we cannot make wine. It's not possible. So you have some people in Champagne that are um, blocking malolactic fermentation. That's something that's been going on for really like the last six or seven years, ourselves included. We're not dogmatic about it, but it, it is definitely moving in that direction. Um, some people are playing around with what we call the cépage oublié, the forgotten varieties of Champagne. You know, we always talk about Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. And that represents over 99% of the plantings of Champagne. But we also have Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Petit Melier, and Alban. Those are also four other varieties that can be planted. We're wondering if maybe some of those might be more resistant to uh, temperature. We had four days in uh, Champagne uh, this year that it was more than 40 degrees. Last year, we had uh, three days where it was more than 40 degrees. That, that's crazy. So we have to really be committed uh, to this. Um, I'm a gentleman, uh, so I don't name names, but I promise you uh, there are a lot of people in Champagne that are chemically acidifying their wines. Um, you cannot uh, legally do that, but uh, they are. Um, what we decided to do was we decided to uh, completely change the way we do our reserve wines. If you were here right now and we went downstairs and I pulled off the rack in the vineyard, a bottle of vintage 1979, so 40 years old, and I disgorged it in front of you and we drank it, you'd be like, Christian, this is so fresh, it's so amazing. Why? Because it's been aging on the lees. So we realized if we can do that for our vintage wines, why don't we use some of that expertise and some of that technology to change the way that we age our reserve wines? 
So we used to need reserve wines to add all of this richness and complexity because all we had was freshness. And those of you that have been to Champagne and done a tasting of Van Clair, I mean, it was austere. I mean, it would literally rip the enamel egg off your teeth. We Christian. don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, someone has just asked if 15 was a great year for you. And I think there may be also a sign that someone may want to say, can we open the first bottle? Oh, yeah, open them Sorry. all. Sorry, oh, I think have, have a bottle of wine. Uh, definitely open a bottle while you're, while you're talking. Um, 15 was quite a warm vintage for you. Am I yeah, right yeah. in thinking that? It was, and uh, I apologize because I've been drinking for the last 10 minutes, but- um, <laughs> Cheers, yeah, so have I. Two, two, but uh, 2015, this, if you just let me finish where I was before, this is perfect yep. for 2015. 2015 is one of the warmest uh, years we've ever had in Champagne. So to go back to the mag uh, system, uh, what we decided to do was aging our reserve wines in magnums for four to six years under a bar and a half of pressure just to keep them fresh. Then we bring them up, blend them in with the base wines, and then the final blend goes down. So what you have right now in front of you, the intense mag 15, that is 55% wine from the 2015 harvest. To that, we added 45% reserve wines, but reserve wines that spent four years aging in magnums under cork, but this is the important part, under a bar and a half of pressure. Your final bottle of champagne is six bars of pressure. The reserve wines are a bar and a half of pressure. It's just enough to keep them fresh. We now need reserve wines to freshen our base wines. We used to need them to add richness. Now we need them to actually freshen them up. The thing that's really cool about this too is that we put front and center mag 14, mag 15, mag 16 right there so that you know. I hate these people in uh, Champagne uh, that you go visit them and there's some like 22 year old in a scarf that goes, we have a house style that we've been making for da 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 da. No, you shouldn't be making the same wine every year. You should be making a better wine every year. And my hope now is that today you say, Christian, the mag 15 is so good, but then you come to the house in 2030 and you say, Christian, the mag 25 is like 10 times better. Like don't make the same wine every year, make better wine every year. I think that should really be the point. So the thing that's really good about our system with mag is that the reserve wines are done in magnums. Uh, so that keeps them fresh. It enables us to talk about climate change. Lots of people in Champagne are like ostriches with their head in the sand. They're not talking about climate change. I, again, hate false dichotomies. I hate champagne versus uh, English sparkling wine, champagne versus Prosecco. I would much rather have my champagne served next to an amazing English producer or an amazing French Accorda producer or an amazing Tasmanian producer than some jerk down the road that's jacking his wines full of chemicals and doesn't care about climate change uh, whatsoever. I think it's really important that we realize that if we're going to beat climate change, we all have to be in this together. We're all agricultural producers around the world. And, and let's break up this, uh, these false dichotomies of, of, of us versus uh, them. 2015 as a year was super hot, um, really, really hot. It was the third hottest year we've ever had uh, in the Appalachian. Um, so as a result, the base wines were very, very, very rich. I love the intense uh, Mag 15 because we're very proud of the uh, parsimonious introduction of the reserve wines. It's still fresh, but it's still very wine-like. It's still very rich. Um, a lot of Champenois uh, say this, uh, I think it's really true. I don't care about the bubbles at all. What we want to do is make uh, wine. Uh, these are designed to be wines. We always drink them out of wine glasses. If you see a champagne flute, like I might have a heart attack. I, I don't understand like why people drink uh, champagne out of flutes. This wine that you have, the Intense Meg 15, um, the reserve wines aged for four years, then were blended in, and then the final blend aged for another four and a half years. So you have a wine that has almost 10 years of different wines and different aging processes together, like that deserves to be enjoyed in a, in a wine glass. Anthony was just saying that he has still got one bottle of 1979. It's so good. It's so it's good. good. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> how, um, how does the 15 compare to the 16 for the Brut Intense? Well, the thing that's quite cool is that um, the... 2014 was the very first mag release. So we started keeping our reserve wines and magnums in 2010. We blended them with base 14, and then that became mag uh, 14. All of our non-vintage wines, uh, 
all four of the different ones we make are now made according to this uh, process. Um, 2014 was quite austere as a year. It was cool. It was chilly. It was uh, the acidity levels were not so bad. So we used 40% reserve wines and the reserve wines are a combination of uh, small barrels, large fruit, stainless steel and uh, magnums as well. So we're probably the only producer in Champagne keeping reserve wines in four different ways. 2015 was so hot and crazy that we needed a lot of reserve wines, almost all of them in magnums because we needed to really keep them fresh. Um, we just released the uh, mag 16 uh, like two weeks ago. So when your order comes in on Monday, you, you literally will be the first people in the UK to taste this one. Um, it's awesome. For me, it's the perfect balance between the austerity of 2014 and the rich, creamy intensity of the 15. Um, I think it's the best one we've made so far. Um, but again, this is in line with what I was saying before, like, I hope 17 is even better than 16 and 18 is even better and 19 is even better. Like, let's just keep making better wines every single year. I, I think the 2016 is awesome. Um, Tim, Tim is asking question in general about 15. Um, he's saying some people are starting to write that it may surpass the iconic 47 vintage. Are you laying down any single vintage wines in 15? So we have so far this century released uh, for our straight Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc. We've released 2002, 2008 and 2012, which is just relaxed. We uh, in the UK, we did also make a Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc uh, 2015 vintage. We did not do a Blanc de Noir. Um, I'm curious, it's, it's always hard. For example, right now, uh, it's over, but the harvest started, you know, two months ago. Everyone always asks us like, you know, are you going to make a vintage? Are you going to make a vintage? Are you going to make a vintage? And there's always some jerk chef de cave that wants to be like on the cover of like, you know, some wine magazine that's like, I da, 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 da. and it's like, okay, it's the third day of harvest, relax. What we do is we come, we, all the wines are being vinified right now. In January, after Christmas, we come back and Anne, Antoine, and I will sit down and we will taste all of the wines in January, February, March, April, May. We will decide in May if we're making a vintage or not. Do we do a Blanc de Noir? Do we do a Blanc de Blanc? And then we'll do the bottling the last week of June, first week of July. We just bottled our vintage uh, 2019, uh, the first week of July. Um, that wine we're expecting to release in 2030 or 2031. So for us, it's really, really important to make sure that we're absolutely positively convinced. Um, there's two things. One, we only make a vintage when you should. Um, we have neighbors that make a vintage every year. Why? Because you've got people all over the world, even here in France, that just think a vintage is better. Go to like a walk around consumer tasting and hear these like, horrible people say things like, I only drink vintage, I don't drink a non-vintage. You're like, okay, great. Have a horrible vintage like 2001 or, or 2007. Um, vintage doesn't necessarily mean better as all of you obviously know. Um, but we have neighbors that they crank out a vintage every year because you can charge more money for it. For us, if your daughter was born in 2012, she's like super lucky because that wine will be amazing for her like 40th birthday. If she was born in 2011, like, that wine's already like kind of tired. So for us, we only make vintages when you should. The next thing is that you can't have 40 to 45, sometimes 50% reserve wines in your non-vintages if you're cranking out a vintage every year. We're kind of proud to be proletariat. We actually think more people would drink champagne if it wasn't so ludicrously like overpriced. So we put a lot of focus on our non-vintage wines. 2015, uh, we made uh, 17,000 bottles which we will continue to taste and taste and taste and um, then decide whether or not we release it. If we don't release it, we'll put it back into the perpetual reserve and it will become uh, another component in our reserve wine um, system. Um, you said you didn't make a 15, 15 Blanc de Noir. No. It was not a good vintage for you for Pinot. We made a vintage Blanc de Noir in 2016, but not in 2000 and 15. My son will be very pleased there's a 16. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> um, 17, uh, nothing. 
uh, 19, 18, no, 19, yes, 20, we're, we're not uh, sharp. But it gets as crazy as, as, as producers because, uh, you know, lots of the wine press has talked about this trilogy of uh, uh, 18, 19, 20 is just like uh, 88, 89, 90, stop, like relax. Like we need to have the time to, to actually make sure that we're gonna be good. Um, for the moment, the 2012 uh, Blonde de Blonde has just been released and it's amazing. And the 2013 uh, Blonde de Dual has just been released, which is also Which we're uh, tasting, amazing. the third wine that we're tasting yeah. tonight. Um, would you, actually, do you want to skip straight to the Blanc de Noir, or would you like to speak about the um, Blanc de Blanc Mac 16 first? I think the Blanc de Blanc Mac 16, maybe just quickly, because, um, so the intense for us is the most important wine for us. I know every Champenois says this, but it's really true. We judge each other here in Champagne, on the quality of your brut non-vintage. So for me, this is the most important wine that I hope that you uh, like. Um, if you go to visit another producer in Champagne and they don't serve you their non-vintage wine, there's something really rotten in the States, of Denmark or wherever you are. Um, the non-vintage wine is how you judge someone. Uh, vintage 2013 Blonde Noir, I mean, we, we, we made 11,000 bottles in a beautiful year for Pinot Noir and it aged on the lees until, you know, about a month and a half ago. Like, that's actually easy. People always say, is your non-vintage wine entry level? And I'm like, no, honestly, our vintages should be our entry level because they're made in such small quantities that they're actually easier to make. So the intent is all three varieties uh, coming from uh, many different vineyard sites that we have in the three villages. The next one is the Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc Chouilly, Mag 16. So this is 100% Chardonnay, uh, 30% reserve wines uh, in Magnums under cork because again, uh, 16 wasn't as warm as uh, 15. So we didn't need quite as uh, much. 100% um, Chardonnay from Chouilly for the reserve wines, 100% Chardonnay from Chouilly for the base wines, everything. Chouilly, as Sarah pointed out, is the northernmost uh, Grand Cru on the Côte Blanc. We have 17 Grand Cru in Champagne of 319 villages. Uh, six of them are on the Côte Blanc. Uh, on the northern part of the Côte de Blanc, you have Chouilly and Oiry and Cremont. Those are closest to the Marne River. There's much more clay in the soil. They're much more fleshy and creamy. Going down the Côte uh, to uh, Avise, uh, Le Ministre Roger in Auger, uh, there you have much more of that awesome, like knife edge of uh, minerality. Um, so one of the things that's quite funny for average uh, consumers is they always go, Chardonnay is floral, Chardonnay is mineral. I mean, if you said something like that, you know, in bone, they'd like laugh you out of town. But Champagne is always like so reductive. It's like Pinot Noir is body and Chardonnay is this and Meunier is fruitiness. And it really, really depends. Uh, but the Chardonnay from Chouilly is very fleshy and very uh, creamy by uh, nature because it's so close to the river. Um, we actually have um, chalk, but there's um, quite a bit of clay uh, on the top. When you go to Bissai, where we make our Blonde Noir, uh, the topsoil is only this. The chalk goes all the way down, but the topsoil is like absolutely uh, nothing. So Shuyi, by its very nature, is very creamy. Uh, Bissai, by its very nature, is very uh, minerally. So um, I love the Grand Cru Blanc Blanc Shuyi and the Mag 16, I think is absolutely uh, great. It's delicious. It has a sort of ripe, ripeness without exoticness, mm. if that makes sense. It's mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic, and I like the sort of uh, the real on the, right on the finish. You have linearity first. Mm. Um, there is a question from Daniel. He's saying that he's heard big issues with growers and prices per ton of grapes in Champagne this year. Mm. Obviously, it's been an unusual and complicated year for you all round. Mm. Um, would you be able to say a little bit more about this? I mean, the thing that I think is important is that I can only speak uh, about me and I can only speak about what our experience is um, at the house. I mean, for example, um, I will respond to that, but just to sort of take this globally, like there's been a lot of like hysterical um, press in France, in the UK, uh, in the US, in Hong Kong about uh, champagne in crisis because it's so clickbaity to say that like, you know, champagne is being wasted, champagne is being left on the ground. Last year, the Appalachian sold 300 million bottles. Estimates say that this year we're going to sell about 200 million uh, bottles. So that's a third less of what we sold as an Appalachian last year. That said, um, 
our wines by their very nature age for such a, a, a long amount of time. I mean, there's not a single wine you're tasting uh, today that doesn't have wines that were conceived of like almost a decade ago. So um, we're patient in Champagne. Like we've been through, I mean, everything from Attila the Hun to, uh, you know, World War I, World War II, countless financial crises like over the years. It's in our very nature to be patient. So the wines that I don't sell this year, like I will sell next year. Um, I also think a producer like us, a producer like Agrippa, like Jackson, like Barrage, like Dibel Valois, like Savard, we're a smaller producer. So maybe there isn't as much urgency. I think if you're a very, very large, more industrial producer um, that's very exposed in duty-free, that's very exposed in airlines, that's very exposed in nightclubs, that's very exposed in supermarkets. I think 2020 has been absolutely uh, horrible. Um, for us, we only sell um, to restaurants, uh, hotels, and through independent uh, retailers like uh, Sanry. So for us, um, I think we're actually like kind of okay. Plus we're primarily making uh, wine from our own grapes. 100% of the Chardonnay is ours from Chouilly. 100% of the Pinot Noir is ours uh, from Bissette. We only have two hectares of uh, Meunier in Demery. So we buy uh, a bit of Meunier from Demery from two uh, growers, uh, one of whom is Antoine and then his cousin uh, here uh, in the village. So for us, we honestly weren't that affected. But I can tell you that there definitely were some people uh, that were. Um, it's very strange the way that we calculate uh, the yield in Champagne. Um, in most parts of the world, it's just based on uh, quality. But in Champagne, it's always sort of based on sales uh, projections. Um, but I, 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 I turned down a lot of, of interviews uh, with people um, from quite respectable uh, publications that it just wanted some clickbait. I was like, oh, you've already written the story and you just want me to provide like a corroborating quote uh, to basically sell your story that Champagne's falling apart. Champagne's not falling apart. Um, the balance we have between growers and houses, we've been dealing with that uh, since the beginning of, of, of the Appalachian. It's very strange. I what do you mean that by that? Well, I just think the fact that for so many years, 80% uh, of the champagne was sold by the houses and 80% of the grapes were grown by the growers. Um, whereas now you have a lot of growers that are actually producing their own wines. Um, so there's a real shift of, of balance there, but the two bodies have always been um, linked. Um, in champagne, obviously we have uh, Crotier brokers, which is a huge business in champagne, which basically if you need to buy uh, grapes, you have someone that will find grapes for you. If you want to sell grapes, for us at Lenoble, we only use the cuvee, uh, which is the, the first uh, press. We sell the Thai, uh, like all of the producers I just mentioned are quite similar to us. Um, we sell the Thai to other people. So we'll find a courtier that will actually sell the Thai. The second pressing from Chouilly of Bissal is still quite good, um, but we only want to focus on the, the cuvee. Again, uh, we don't have any shareholders. If I had some guy in Paris with a gun to my head, telling me I needed to sell more or sell to airlines or sell to who knows what, we'd never be able to do that. But it keeps us independent by bringing in a bit of cash flow uh, and also enabling it to sell it. But the Cotier not only sell our second pressing to other producers, they also buy grapes for people. Um, the Marché sur Lat uh, still exists in Champagne as well. For example, if uh, I am the owner of Champagne Christian and Sarah is the owner of Champagne Sarah, Sarah's an amazing salesperson and I'm horrible. Legally in Champagne, Sarah can buy bottles of Champagne Christian. And as long as she riddles them and disgorges them at her winery, she can then put Champagne Sarah on the label. Um, I talk very openly about this because I think it's absolutely horrible. If you're most people and you've spent X amount of quid on a bottle of Champagne, can you imagine how horrible it is that that has actually been made by another um, producer? Um, and again, we don't name names, but when you visit producers and when you meet producers, like ask them questions. Um, Gideon was just saying, because I think he visited you last year. Yes. That, um, <laughs> he, um, he was saying how amazing you treat your employees. Um, and talking about communal meals, I guess there were no communal meals this year for people in, at harvest. 
I mean, again, for us, like we have uh, our four guys in the vineyard and then we have our four guys uh, in the cellar. Uh, but then um, for the harvest, we bring in uh, four guys. Um, we had, it was really funny because uh, Anne and Antoine's uh, parents were both uh, doctors as well. Uh, uh, their mother was an anesthesiologist and their father was a, um, an OBGYN. And back in 1981, one of the nurses at the hospital had uh, married this Polish guy and had a son that lived in uh, Krakow uh, that uh, came and worked the harvest uh, in 1981. His son and uh, his friends come back every single year for the harvest and live with us uh, at the house. Um, so, um, you know, there are four guys there, four guys there, Anne, Antoine and me, like it's, it's a pretty small group. And then in the vineyards, uh, you know, obviously um, people are, are a bit more spread apart. We were all wearing masks during the whole uh, harvest. No, for us, um, again, I mean, we have convictions and, 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 you know, it's not to judge others. It's just, this is what's important to me. And this is what's important to Anne and Antoine is that um, when people work for harvest, we make sure that they eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We make sure that they're looked after. We make sure that we know where they're sleeping. Um, if you've ever come to Champagne during the harvest, it's amazing to see like all of these like camper vans like um, on the side of the road and people sleeping in tents and you know braziers like hanging from trees. You think we're like the king of wines and the wine of kings. And um, I think that uh, we should talk a little bit more openly about how um, we treat the people that come uh, pick our uh, grapes. I also think it's really important to pay people that pick grapes by the hour. A lot of people in Champagne pay them by the kilo. Trust me, if you're from Eastern Europe and you have a young family to support and you're being paid by the kilo, you will put everything in that basket in order to get the weight up. If you pay them by the hour, you actually take, encourage them to take the time to sort uh, on the vineyard. We then sort again when it comes to the house, but the first and foremost, it obviously starts uh, at the vineyard. So I think it's, um, do you say this in English? It's like a, a virtuous uh, cycle. Like if you treat people well, they'll treat you well. And they, we have the same teams uh, in the vineyard and in the uh, winery that come back every single year. So not only do, are we treating them well, but they come back and they actually know us as people and they know the vineyards and they know how we operate and they know what we do and they know what we want to. So it creates a real uh, form of um, consistency and uh, stability. Um, going to the um, Blanc de Noir, um, which I absolutely do. I have to say, I've always been a Pinot um, girl when it comes to Champagne. Um, and I think the really vinous character of that is wonderful. When we, I mean, the 13, you say it's just been released. Um, when, how long would you age it and when would be the perfect time to drink it for, in your view? I mean, I think in Champagne you had um, like some years that were really classic years in Champagne. Like for me, that's 2002, 2008 and 2012. We've won so many like awards and stuff for all of those wines. And Antoine uh, always says, if you couldn't make a great wine in 2002, 2008 or 2012, you probably should not be a winemaker. Um, 2013. Um, for us was very uh, parcelar. Um, we had three plots in Visay that we just loved. And we were like, we're gonna make a, a Blanc de Noir. As I said, it's a very, very small uh, production. Uh, Gentilhomme, which is a, another uh, wine that we have, which is a Grand Cru Blanc Blanc from Chouilly. Uh, that comes from four plots. Um, that we made 9,000 bottles of as well. So 2013 wasn't a great vintage everywhere, but in certain parcels we had, it was um, very, very good. A lot of people wrote off 2013 because 2012 was such a huge like success, but I really, really, really like um, 13. And the 13s are just being released, uh, the 12s and 13s are just being released now. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the 2012 Blonde de Blanc for me, I think will be amazing in four, five, six years. Um, the 2013 the wine, Blonde... The wine enthusiast is saying it's the most pluggable wine for the Christmas yeah, period. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they love it now. Um, and again, you know, a lot of times people don't put champagne down to age. They want it right now. Um, the Blanc de Noir, I actually think this wine, uh, I had it uh, yesterday, the 2013. I think it's awesome, like right now. But I think it could also age for another 10, 15, 20 years, like no problem. Do you like this one? I love it. Mm. I absolutely love it. But I, I, I like the Venice quality of it. 
Um, I like the sort of there's a, there's actually I wrote, what I wrote down for me it it has a real Pinot character. Mm. If someone says, well, how do you know if something is a Chardonnay or a Pinot Champagne? I mean, you give them this, they will forever recognize yeah, what yeah. a Pinot based champagne will taste like. It's got a real, um, really powerful structure and it makes me want to have it with food. Um, I would, you know, th that with a beef carpaccio would be perfect. Mm. Um, whereas I think the, um, the Blanc de Blanc, I would probably have more by itself um, mm. or, um, or probably with more fish, fish dishes. Um, but no, I just think, that, but I, I've always liked my Pinot um, champagnes, um, mm -hmm. but I just think it's beautiful. Um, I think I think that people forget that Blanc de Noir can be so amazing um, because uh, people for years they always think Blanc de Blanc Blanc de Blanc Blanc de Blanc but there's a lot of amazing like Blanc de Noir out there um, like uh, Exilier is a really really nice Blanc de Noir yeah. um, I, I think ours is actually quite good it's funny because uh, Anne and Antoine's dad was born in uh, Chouilly and is their mother was born in Bisay and it was the first one we made was in 1998. And she said to the kid, she was like, okay, I get that your dad's Grand Cru, but Premier Cru is still okay. Huh? Why don't you make like a uh, Premier Cru Blanc de Noir uh, from my village? Um, so the 2013 is only the sixth uh, time we've ever released uh, Blanc de Noir. So it's, it's quite uh, special for us. I love it. And thank you for saying beef carpaccio, because yes, exactly. Like um, <laughs> people need to realize that um, champagne pairs more beautifully with so many different things. We're quite um, like uh, strong about this at the house. I hate these Christmas articles every year in the whole world where they always do these ridiculous champagne pairings with food. And it's always like lobster and caviar. Here in Champagne, like what we drink, uh, what we eat with Champagne most of the time is uh, Cyril, my guy up the street that uh, raises uh, chickens. He has an organic chicken farm. We eat roast chicken with champagne all the time. Like uh, Conte, uh, 18 months, that's it. Like uh, pâté en crute, uh, you know, which is like the yeah. pâté that we have, that we wrap with the uh, crust. Like we eat really, really simple things. Um, and I think that we have to democratize champagne like a little bit more. Like beef carpaccio is so easy. You purchase it, it's already made, open a bottle of champagne. And you know what? You had a, a rough Tuesday. You're stuck at home. You've got the kids. You're both working from home. You just need a break. Like. Pour yourself a glass of Blonde Noir and have some Carpaccio. It doesn't have to be the That's New heavenly. Year's Eve with caviar. <laughs> My God. Daniel was actually just saying that he had um, his intense Mac 15 tonight with a hot Indian lamb curry. And it reminded me when I just started in the wine trade, if, um, I worked with a girl who was half Indian and her father made the most amazing curries and he swore by champagne being the perfect match for curry. Um, it is, and I'm not sure if Daniel, if you were on the call that uh, the last Zoom that we did with Saturday, which was on the 15th of uh, July, but no joke, and Tom Bird was a witness to this, I actually was making uh, Indian curry that night on the stove, and some people didn't believe me, so I stood up and I took my computer into the kitchen <laughs> and showed them. Um, I love the intense with uh, Indian curry. I think it's awesome. Um, I think it can go with so many different um, kinds of food. Um, yeah. It cuts through. And Daniel has another question for you. Mm -hmm. What other sparkling wine from outside Champagne do you like? A lot. Um, <laughs> for me, again, I think it's about, um, this is sort of where I think we are in sort of the cultural wine zeitgeist of 2020, is that it's not so much about appellations anymore, it's about producers. Um, for example, I find the whole champagne versus English sparkling wine uh, thing, like ridiculous. There's always like some like newspaper that's like X uh, English sparkling wine beat Y uh, champagne in a blind tasting. And I'm like, well, that champagne is garbage. It's like absolutely disgusting and like horrible. I don't think you can uh, judge regions uh, versus uh, regions. I think it's about judging um, different producers which has been a real wake up call because like my grandfather, for example, champagne was the best uh, sparkling wine in the world, but he had never tasted sparkling wine from Italy, from Tasmania, from uh, Spain, from California, but he just knew. The Bordelais are in the same situation in Bordeaux because the Bordeaux are just like, we're Bordeaux, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best. I think that our generation now, we're getting uh, much better at being a little bit more uh, open-minded. Uh, um, for example, 
it's not just about an appellation to an appellation, it's about the producers. A lot of people are so happy just sitting on their laurels saying, uh, we've always been the best. Well, maybe you're not anymore. Um, so why not work together? Like someone I really, really like in the, the UK is I really like um, Gus Ford. I like uh, Charlie. Uh, a lot. I think he's a really good winemaker and Laura Reese uh, is a really good friend. And I think that they have real human uh, values and the way that they think and the way that they um, support each other and the way that they approach the land and the way that they approach stuff. I think Gus Born, for example, is like a really, really good uh, producer um, in the UK. Um, but I think there's a number of people in the UK that are doing really good work. One of the things that we really encourage uh, is for people to come visit us. I uh, have had the opportunity to visit a number of producers uh, in England, um, obviously not in the last uh, eight months, but uh, previously. And I think that's really cool because we can learn from each other and teach each other. Um, I think you now have 20 people who are going to come and turn up at Lenobe. <laughs> But I'd much rather I'd much rather have Lenoble served alongside uh, Gaspar, Jeff, which is a producer in uh, Tasmania. I think they do a really really good job. Um, Pepe Raventos uh, from uh, the Penedes, who's like so cool that he decided that he doesn't want to be part of Cava anymore. He just wants to make best uh, sparkling wine, but totally lose all of the baggage that uh, comes with it. He's a great guy and an amazing winemaker and um, shares a lot of the same values uh, that I do. So for me, uh, serving Lenoble at a tasting next to Gasborn, uh, Raventos, and uh, Jens, like, that's awesome. Like, I would much, much rather do that than have it sit next to just these old, like, you know, Champenois that just think we're the best, like, soft, you're not. They're not. And it's more than just, no one cares about what happened in the 18th century. No one cares about these stories that might have happened or might not have happened with Marie Antoinette or blah, blah, blah. That's not what people want. When I was, I'm 46 years old. When I was a kid, um, people would come to Champagne. They wanted to sit in a room. We were all wearing suits and talking about Marie Antoinette and caviar and, uh, you know, the world war. Um, that's not what people want anymore. They want to come to the vineyard. They want to see how we farm. They want to see how are we dealing with the issues in the vineyard? How are we dealing with things like climate change? So I would much rather um, have more friends around the world that are also committed to the same values. In terms of um, climate change um, and the future of Champagne and also actually taking into account what you just said about some people not wanting to change their ways, but people elsewhere in the world doing. What do you think is the future for Champagne? Mm. And Daniel's also asking, what about still wine in Champagne? Will there be a future for still wine considering climate change it becoming warmer? Daniel, you need to get over here with your Indian curry. I feel like we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, I think that uh, there's a couple of things there. One on climate change, uh, as I said before, you have people that are uh, playing around with different varieties. Um, you have people that are playing around with blocking mellow. There's another group of people that have been wondering about Coteau Champenois. So Coteau Champenois obviously still wines from uh, Champagne. Um, there's a couple of producers that have been doing these for a while. Um, I think Boulanger's is actually quite good. I think Raphael Barrache makes a very good one as well. Um, there's not that many, but there is some discussion that could things move in that direction. Um, you have to remember that um, we were still wine for a huge part of our history. The only reason that Champagne is famous and, and all the nonsense aside, the only reason that we're famous is that our very first king of France, Clovis, uh, converted to Christianity in what became Reims, the capital of Champagne, in 496 in the fifth century. We became the king of wines and the wine of kings going all the way back. So every French monarch had to go to Reims to receive the crown before they could go to Paris and sit on the throne in Paris. So we were always the king of wines and the wine of kings and we started to be emulated and we were served like, you know, in the British Royal Court and the Swedish Royal Court, et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't actually become sparkling until the late 17th, early 18th century. So we were a still wine place for a huge part of our region. Now, um, Champagne is so associated with uh, with bubbles, 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 like all the time. Some people are thinking about, should we do more with still wine? Um, 
I don't know. I mean, if you had told Sarah and I were discussing this before you guys joined before the last time we saw each other was in London, uh, the first uh, week of uh, March. If you had told me in March that we'd still be talking about COVID in, in November, I wouldn't have believed you. So I have no idea what the Appalachian is going to be doing in 20 years. Um, my concern is that given how expensive grapes are in Champagne, and if you were buying grapes uh, last year, you're averaging about seven euros a kilo. It's 1.4 kilos just to make a bottle of everyday champagne. Um, so the still wines are so ungodly expensive that uh, being you know, someone who is, is quite um, fond of, of Burgundy like all of you are, for a, a still Pinot Noir for 30 pounds, I, 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 I might go to 70 Le Bon. You know, I, 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 I might go outside of Champagne. Um, but it's definitely something that uh, we, we are thinking about. Who knows what the Appalachian could look like in 100 years? Could we throw, um, growing Sierra or something. Um, mm. This is our Christmas tasting. And what are you having for Christmas? Well, the, we've been laughing about this because Anna, Todd, and I, so we're all married. And we're like, OK, so clearly this year we might not be able to see like our parents or grandparents. Like we don't necessarily know what we're going to be able to do. But we definitely all know what we're going to be uh, drinking. Um, so one of the things that we decided that we wanted to, to do, which would be the first time that we've done it, um, but we really want to do it, is Anne, Antoine, and I, the three of us, want to celebrate uh, kind of a, a Christmas just uh, ourselves with our partners, so the six of us. Um, and we want to taste through uh, Mag uh, 14, 15, and 16 blind, uh, intense Grand Cru Blanc Blanc, Chouilly, and Brut Nature. Uh, and the Rosé Terroir. Um, we think it'd be really cool, like, you know, just to actually be able to compare the different uh, things uh, blind. Uh, we thought it would be kind of like a fun, a fun, small committee uh, Christmas uh, activity. If one of you fails to recognize the right vintage, <laughs> are they expelled afterwards? <laughs> No, I mean, I would be the one to be expelled because I'm, I'm not a member of the family. I'm like the, the weird cousin that like lives in the broom closet. Um, but uh, no, Anna and Antoine own the company, so I, I don't think they'll be expelled. But uh, it's always interesting because we do a lot of blind tastings uh, at the house um, because we're always led by this preconceived uh, craft. There's a final question here. Um, what's your recommendation for the perfect glass to drink champagne from? And I can see um, Sarah has, has the coupe, which is beautiful. And um, what is your preferred glass for drinking champagne? I mean, right now I'm just drinking this from like a very normal uh, white wine uh, glass. I think that um, the white wine glass is really like the best way to go. Um, because I think that you can get the aromas. And essentially, it's, it's, it's wine. I mean, people talk about Chouilly uh, as being very much like Pouligny, very much like Merceau. It's that kind of like creamy, like buttery kind of thing. There's so much going on that if you have your nose in a small flute, you don't get anything. The only reason that flutes took off, the only reason that flutes took off is when catering became like a big thing, um, which was like in the 70s, because in Paris, like uh, the opera, you had the intermission. You had uh, 12 minutes to get a glass of champagne in before you went and sat down for another hour and a half. So they needed to pre-pour all of the champagne. So the champagne was always like pre-poured. Um, weddings, the champagne is always like pre-poured. And what do people want most from champagne? Bubbles, 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 bubbles. And I find it so ludicrous because um, people always say like, Wow, I love the bubbles, such small bubbles. These are large, aggressive bubbles. Almost all of the time, it has everything to do with the glass. Does the glass have traces of dishwashing detergent on it? Does the glass, uh, is it scored on the bottom? Is it like a small flute? Is it a big flute? Um, one of the things that's really, really fun to do is to take a bottle of uh, champagne or sparkling wine at home and just literally pour it into like six different glasses, like even like a water glass, like a Bordeaux glass, like just pour it in all these different uh, things and then actually, uh, you know, taste them uh, and evaluate them. And you can see that it changes um, so much, but we, we, we sort of lost our minds like a hundred years ago and started communicating about bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. And then that's all that people talk about anymore. And they forget to talk about champagne as a wine.
Um, there's many different, at the house, we love uh, Zalto. So we use a lot of the Zalto uh, white wine glasses uh, at uh, Noble. They're gorgeous, they're expensive, and they you look at them and they break. I mean, they're, they're, they're quite fragile, the stems. But um, I like Zalto, but I, I also think as long as you have a nice white wine glass, that's fine. I love Zalto as long as someone else is washing up. Exactly. We actually found that there's a Zalto rack that we bought for the dishwasher because Antoine and I were like looking at them and they were breaking and they're so expensive. And it was a big joke. It was like we'd always be like trying to pass the buck to someone else to get to wash the glasses. But now we have our Zalto rack and they're good. Do you have the Zalto flute or do you use the Zalto white wine glass? White wine glass. Yes, just because the aroma comes out more. Always white wine glass. Um, but no, uh, Anne, one of Anne uh, Madison's, so Anton's sister, who started, uh, who took over from their dad first, um, she uh, three years ago co founded La Transmission. Uh, and La Transmission is a group of nine women who own uh, and run champagne houses uh, today. And one of the things that they talk a lot about is they do a lot of um, blind tastings with different glasses, and they're trying to talk about uh, glassware. Um, so it's uh, it's Anne, it's uh, Maggie Enriquez, who's the president of Krug, uh, Visili Tétanger, uh, Charlene Drapier, uh, Ms. Payard from uh, Bruno Payard, uh, Melanie Tarlon. It's like a really cool group of women. Um, and their idea was um, came from this frustration that when you're a woman and you run a champagne house uh, today, people always ask questions about, were you inspired by uh, La Veuve Clicquot or like Lily Boulanger or like Louise Pomeroy? And Anne and Maggie, who are quite uh, good, good friends, uh, they always say like, I'm sure they were lovely people, but they've been dead for like, you know, 100 to 150 years. What about women running champagne houses today? Um, and let's have more of a focus on that. And so they've been doing that now for three years and they do a big uh, tasting every year in uh, Paris where um, they invite people to come and they do blind tastings where people are blindfolded and basically they taste out of different glasses. And the idea is really just to challenge people's uh, notions. Um, yeah. So again, I think one of the things we're really good at in Champagne is sort of working together. Um, find other people that share your values and share your convictions and, and work together, man. No, I think you're absolutely right. And um, Christian, thank you so much. Time has absolutely flown. Um, thank you, a huge thank you from all of us um, for joining us tonight. I have definitely enjoyed the champagnes. Um, Thank you. I'll just say um, one more thing, two more things, if, if you don't mind. Yep. Uh, the last th two things I want to say is uh, once we can travel again, come visit us. Um, Gideon has been to visit us uh, before. Um, all of you are welcome to come visit us. Um, we really appreciate your support. Um, we really appreciate uh, the interest that you have in the house, but please come visit us so that we can open some really cool stuff together. Um, the other thing is that this is our 100th uh, birthday. So one of the things that uh, a lot of houses do when they celebrate an anniversary is they they create some like, I'm gonna swear, you can handle it, some bullshit like fake uh, prestige cuvee that they then charge a ridiculously high price for. What we decided to do instead was we wanted to release uh, vintages made by the previous four generations of the family. So um, we have, less than 10, 11 bottles left, uh, maybe. Um, but uh, it's uh, 2002, 1996, uh, 1990, 88, 86, 82. I think I might have 10 or 11 uh, bottles left. Uh, but if um, any of you would be interested in one of those bottles, which have all been uh, disgorged uh, now this year after aging perfectly in our cellars downstairs for the last uh, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, etc. cetera. Um, please speak with Sarah uh, afterwards and um, we'll try and get them to you. They are absolutely exceptional. I can vouch for it. I had one bottle for a special birthday this year. Um, mm. I love your vi vision and philosophy of that every year should be better um, for a so-called non-vintage champagne. There should not be a house style. And I just think that is brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm sending you right now for everyone so that everyone has it, uh, my uh, Instagram and also my personal email. So if you want, if you have any questions about champagne and not even just about Lenoble, but just if you have questions about champagne, the appellation, vintages, our neighbors, 
uh, when you want to visit, uh, honestly, like we're very, very, very cool here. Just drop me a line or send me a private message and we will definitely sort you out. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. And I think 3rd of December, we're all coming over when, when lockdown finishes. Oh my God, run. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom.